set apart for the kingdom? Do you call upon the Lord? Do you call upon the Lord today? Amen. You've been saved and he's done great and mighty things in you. Hallelujah. And God is getting ready to flex. God is getting ready to do some things on this earth. People's hearts are going to know that he is God, that he is Lord, that he is seated on the throne. The enemy's time is going to come to an end very shortly, and God is going to reign. He's going to shine like the sun.
got everything I need, and I've never missed a meal. Unless I wanted to. Unless I was fasting. So just say, God loves you. And in that prophecy, he said, I love you. And he said, I give you everything that you need in that prophecy. He says, all I want from you is your heart. Amen? Praise God. Quick testimony.
Gilbert, come on up here. Yesterday, wasn't supposed to go in, but someone said, we need your help really bad. Got there, and there was one particular resident that kept asking for me. I need to talk to her. She needs to, and they kept saying, Rachel's not here. She's not here. She's not coming in today. And then, lo and behold, I ended up having to go in. So she asked someone again. She goes, Rachel just got here. Went to that resident's room. She was just kept saying, I don't feel good. I don't know what's wrong. What's going on? And so I was asking her a bunch of different questions, and she looked at me, and she said, you realize that today has been one year since my husband's passed away. And I looked at her, and I said, can I pray with you? And she said, absolutely. So I held her hand, prayed with her. We cried together, loved on her. And for the rest of the day, her day was better. And I knew that regardless, I wasn't on call, wasn't planning on being there, didn't want to necessarily go in at 9.30 in the morning, but God knew that she needed me. He knew that I was the one that needed to help her day. So I just want to encourage you guys that being at the right place at the right time, doing the right thing, even if you don't want to get out of bed or you don't want to do whatever that is, don't want to talk to that person, I just want to encourage you to go ahead and do it. Amen. Yeah. Amen. 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 So be available. Hallelujah. Jesus is Lord. Can you say amen? amen? He gets all the glory. Amen. And Jesus is moving. Jesus is moving among his people. Amen. He's moving inside of us. And uh, I mean, it's just, it's amazing to be serving such a loving God who invites us in uh, to his presence. Can you say amen? who invites us in to be a part of his kingdom, of what he's doing. And this morning, as I was just, as I was just meditating, <laughs> worshiping the Lord in my mind and my heart, and uh, as we're kicking off prayer uh, this week again, and you're like, what, what, why are we kicking it off? Sometimes you got to relaunch. Can you say amen? Yeah. Amen. And, and we've had seasons of prayer, and we've had decades of prayer. And for a brief period, we hit pause. Sometimes you got to hit pause. We shifted to some Sunday night prayer, but we're kicking back to Tuesday night and, and just want to spend this morning kind of teaching on prayer. And sometimes when we're talking about these things, they come out as a, as a condemnation, as a you aren't good enough. How many of y'all, when you hear a convicting message, you feel that way? Like somebody's just taking a hammer and just beating you down in the head. Amen? It's like, you can do more. Like, you have 24 hours in a week, or 24 hours in a day, seven days a week. <clears throat> can, are you not good enough to pray at some point during that time period? And you feel guilty. It's like, man, but we hung out with the kids, and we had to go to football, and we had to do this, and we ate dinner. And, and sometimes when these messages come out, it's like a beat down. But what I wanted to come out as is a build up. Instead of a condemnation, I want it to be an invitation. Can you say amen? amen. That God's inviting us to interact with him, and the way he invites us to interact with him is through prayer. It's through praise. It's through worship. It's through the reading of his word. Can you say amen? amen. Let's, let's pray, and we'll talk about a few things. Father, we love you. We glorify you. We give you all praise, all honor, our glory. Lord, we come before you in the name of Jesus, the name that's above all names, the name given under heaven whereby we must be saved, that at the name of Jesus, uh, demons have to flee. The deaf ears have to be opened, that blind eyes have to see, that the mute speak, the lame walk again, that it's at the name of Jesus, the name above all names. Lord, we don't take these things lightly, Lord God. Lord God, where you convict us, Lord God, we're open to your conviction. Where we need correction, Lord, correct us. Where we've been beat down, Lord God, build us back up again. Lord, we thank you that your word edifies, that your word constructs, that your word tears down mindsets and false thoughts and lies that we believe. Lord, we seek your truth as we seek your face. In Jesus' name, everybody in agreement with that say, 
Amen. Amen. This one, the uh, early theologian, John Bunyan, wrote The Pilgrim's Progress. Early church martyr spent time in prison because he was seeking God. He said this, In prayer it is better to have a heart without words than words without heart. In prayer it is better to have a heart without words than words without heart. Will Rogers wrote this. He said, about all I can say about the United States Senate is that it opens with prayer and closes with an investigation. <laughs> Corey Ten Boone wrote this, said this, any, too, any concern too small to be turned into a prayer is too small to be made into a burden. Doing some research on this topic over the years, I found this. The average Christian, the average Christian in the United States prays three to seven minutes a day. 21 to 49 minutes a week. According to uh, Barna Research, uh, more than four out of five adults in the U.S., 84% claim they have prayed in the past week. That has been the case since Barna has been tracking since 1993. U.S. News and the Internet site BeliefNet funded a poll about this. 75% say they were Christians. 64% say they pray more than once a day. 56% say most, they most often pray for family members. And 3.3% say they pray for strangers. A little over 38% say that the most important purpose of prayer is intimacy with God. I wonder what the other 62% say. 41% say their prayers are answered often, but only 1.5% say their prayers are never answered. 5% say they pray most often in a house of worship, and 79% say they pray most often at home. 67% say that in the last six months, their prayers have been related to continually giving thanks to God. Prayer is powerful. Can you say amen? amen? The Bible contains over 377 references to prayer and 373 references, or sorry, 377 references to praise and over 375 references to prayer. If so many people believe in prayer and are supporting prayer, if so many people feel that prayer works, then why aren't we doing it? Lack of time, no focus, unwillingness, unbelief, perhaps selfishness, desire for other things, maybe even disappointment or discouragement, mental blockades. The list can go on. Here's the thing about prayer. You don't know how much you need it until you do it. You don't know how much you need prayer until you start praying. I'll say this about my own prayer time. Prayer is like going to the gym. Like you don't go to the gym very often, Pastor. I know it's because I'm praying. <laughs> <laughs> And then the Spirit of the Lord goes, you could pray and walk on the treadmill at the same time, too. <laughs> it's kind of like going to the gym. You may struggle to get there, but you're never disappointed when you leave. You may struggle to get into prayer. I don't know very many people that are disappointed when they say their amen. Turn your Bibles over to Matthew chapter 6, and verse We'll go ahead and start at verse 5, since we always start early. I give you one scripture, then we move back. <clears throat> you all know that by, about me, most of you do by now. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 5 says, says, And when you pray, these are the words of Jesus, 
notices here first in this verse we're reading that Jesus is assumptive, Come on. that his yeah. people are praying. Yeah. And when you pray, and when you pray, yes. you shall not be like the hypocrites. Man, how many of you guys ever ran into somebody who's two-faced? <laughs> <laughs> This word hypocrite in the Greek, actually, the word hypocrite in the Greek, when you break it down, it actually means actor. It's as if it's a person in the play. And early on in theater, what they would do is they'd have a single person play multiple parts. And they'd come up with a new mask each time that they're playing a different part. So a hypocrite is a person who's putting on a new mask for whatever part of the play they're presenting. Jesus is saying that when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. Don't be like those that are putting on a show. Don't be like those who are just worried about what the outward appearance looks like and not so much what is happening on the inside. Don't be like the one that, that will kiss you on the cheek one day, then stab you in the back on the next. Don't be like that. Those are hypocrites. Here's the thing. Once you find somebody who is two-faced or hypocrite, you can hardly ever trust them again because you don't know what they're going to present to you the next time. Proverbs tells us this, that the wounds of an enemy can be trusted, but the kisses of an enemy, or the kisses, the wounds of a friend can be trusted, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Be careful when people come at you with the flattery of the lips. Don't always take them for face value because some people cannot be taken at face value because they're wearing a mask. Flattery gets us nowhere. Can you say amen? Like, what's flattery? You're the best. I need you. You're important. You're the only, you are the only one. You're, you're the only one that I can bring this to. And we do it in houses of worship. We do it in our jobs. It happens in our family. And I'll say this, if you've got a spirit of discernment on you, you should be able to sniff out flattery super quick because it stinks. Can you say amen? Amen. Jesus is saying here, he says, when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. Don't be like those who are two-faced. For they love to pray standing in the synagogue and on the corner streets. Everything they're doing is about presentation. It's outward. It's drawing attention to themselves. See how spiritual I am. I'll wear special clothes to prove how spiritual I am. Don't be like those people. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to say it, Pastor. You know what I'm saying. I'm not going to say it. Maybe I'll say it later. All right. It's okay. I don't have to get my Jewish prayer on to go pray to God. Number one, I'm not Jewish. Okay. And more importantly than preparing the external, I'm to come to God with prepared heart. That's right. That's right, amen. And I don't have to put on a presentation or a show. That's right. Right. And sometimes my most effective prayers have been God help. That's right. That's right. Amen. Yes, amen. God, I need you. God, I don't know what to do. And I don't know where else to go. And I've exhausted every single path. My resources are gone. I'm at my wit's end. And God, you're the only one that can save in this situation. So instead of putting on a presentation outwardly, I come to you with a torn heart. Joel tells us that we're to render our hearts and not our garments. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues. If Jesus was saying this, he's like, they love to live stream their prayers on YouTube. <laughs> it chaps me sometimes. Can you tell? 
<laughs> we started singing about heaven to earth today. Sometimes when heaven comes to earth, there's no holding back. Can you say amen? <laughs> and when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. Are they all hypocrites? No, they're not all, all hypocrites. But they can be, and there are some. <sighs> For they love to pray on their YouTube and their live streams and on the corner streets that they may be seen by men. I'm going to go back and I'm going to check our metrics and our analytics on my prayer live stream. And I'm going to do more of the things that get, garners more clicks than not. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. They'll get their gold or platinum YouTube sticker. They got their follower base. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you pray, but when you pray, go into your room. Turn off the camera. It's not just about broadcasting coffee and Jesus. As you get the Starbucks logo perfectly positioned so they get their marketing in the middle of it. When you pray, Go into your room. Go into the secret place. Yes. Go into private. And when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward openly. Why are there people that are blessed today? And like you don't have a clue as why they're blessed? Maybe it's because they're in their prayer room doing things behind the scenes, interceding on behalf of their friends. I know some folks in here that are, prayer, that are people of prayer, like you feel guilty about even praying for yourself. That you'll pray for everybody else and believe for everybody else. But when it comes to you, it's like I'm too humble to pray for myself. Well, if you read the Psalms, David, David prays for himself a whole lot. Why? Because David was a mess. Like, but he was God's king. He was God's man. And he was a mess. And when you pray, verse 6, go into your room. And when you have shut the door, pray to your father who is in the secret place. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. As I read this, I think of this. How many of you guys grew up with your mom that said, God's like, God's watching you? <laughs> I grew up with a mom like that. God's watching you. God's watching you. He knows what you're doing. When you're behind the closed doors and in your bedroom, he sees. He knows your internet browsing history before, you even, before it's even on the screen. He knows. He knows what you're doing. You better stop doing that. Stop doing that. Stop doing that. He sees in secret. And like, man, I'd be like laying in bed like. <laughs> Don't move because God's watching. God knows. It's like, man, that's like, like I don't, I don't want to be God because I don't want to know what happens in other people's rooms. I don't. It's like, ah. It's like, not only does he see what's happening outwardly, but he can, he knows my thoughts. <laughs> like, what is, like, man, I don't, I don't even tell everybody all my own thoughts out of embarrassment, and God already knows. Like, how many of you feel that way sometimes? Like, you get that thought, and you're, like, apologizing to God. Like, man, I guess, sorry I even got that thought. Like, ah. But that's taking your thoughts captive. But here's, here's the other side of God's watching you. Here's the balance that we didn't get as kids. Because he sees us, what we do in secret, and he rewards it. Because when we interpret it first, we think of all the bad things we're, we've done. And how we're going to be penalized. Well, let me say this about judgment. This is the, how many of you guys believe God is just? Yeah. And God is a good judge. Here's, here's the thing about judgment. Judgment has the ability to not only condemn for penalties, but it has the ability to bless for that which honors the judge. Good. And when he sees in secret, and he sees interceding on behalf of our friends. 
and he sees how we give without compulsion and cheerfully and without like making a big show of it. He goes, I can, I can bless that one because I can trust him. If you help out a widow or an orphan and you go fix a squeaky hinge on a door or fix a faucet or a doorknob or what, what, you fix a garage door, sometimes you turn a sprinkler head. It's, it's, those, it's like those don't have to be broadcast to everybody of how great we are, but God sees and he goes, you know what? I can trust that person. Because they're willing to make a sacrifice for somebody else. And I'm going to, re- what, because of what they're doing in secret, I'm going to reward them openly. And people are going to be confused as to why they're as blessed as they are. Like they're not the smartest, they're not the sharpest, they're not the prettiest, they're not the tallest, they're not, they're not whatever everybody else esteems that, but they're blessed. Because God can trust you. And God's rewarding those things in the secret place. The secret place is a special place. Can you say amen? You're like, but then why are you guys coming down here to pray publicly? Because when the Holy Spirit came down, they were all gathered in one accord in one place, and they prayed openly. So how about we do both with the right heart? With the right heart. Verse 6, but when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in, he- in, is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, again, when you pray, when you pray, when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do. When we pray, it is not an, it is not an incantation to somehow receive something from God. There's, there's not some formula of prayer of if you say these words, in this way, in this rhythm, with this inflection, a certain number of times, then somehow God responds to that. Because God responds to our what? He responds to our heart. And faith is of the heart. He's responding to our faith. (laughs) You can can pray a 60-minute prayer that's eloquent, that uses King James English Come on. <laughs> with proper enunciation and fluidity and it be empty in the heart, your prayers are useless. But the prayer of a young mom who's holding her sick child, who's at her wit's end, doesn't have the energy even in and of herself. Say, God, touch my baby. That can be the, one of the most faith-filled prayers that that person can ever pray. Can you say amen? amen? And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they will be heard by their many words. Well, if I just, this word, like if I, we get this in our mind, like if I just pray enough, God will hear me. If I just pray enough, God will hear me. If I just pray enough, God knows your heart. And he hears his children. Can you say amen? amen? He hears the cries of his children. It goes all the way back to Exodus chapter 1. If there's one thing growing up as a father, I know the sound of my child's cry. Can you say amen? amen. There's a period and there's a season, a long season. Long season where we had a crying kid at some point in our family. And whenever there's a cry in the back, I'd go like, ah, it's mine. And but I'm up here preaching, so I'm kind of, then it's all on my wife. Then she's got to go deal with it. And because I'm not there to support her, she's dealing with it. She's dealing with me later. Sometimes that's just pastor problems that we got, we got to navigate. But I'll say this, now as we have some other crying kids in here, praise God we got crying kids. Can you say amen? Because they're the evidence of life. Because kids, kids, kids that don't cry means they're not breathing. Amen. We need kids that are we need kids that are active. Can you say amen? Amen. 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 We walk we walk in and you might see a mark on the wall. Like, you know what? That's evidence. <laughs> Y'all I, I didn't even say which mark. 
And you got like five parents that are going like this, like that's my kid. He's talking about my kid. I'm not, ta- I'm not talking about your kid, but I know what your kid did. <laughs> but it could be the pastor's kid. I know it's the pastor's kid. Isaiah's carved his name into the sound booth back there here a while back. It's, it's there. It ain't going anywhere. So it's like well, there's an IAD. I'm glad he wrote IAD instead of IED but because his middle name is Alan, not Ellen. So anyways, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. Like we know the cries of our kid. It's like, ah, that's my kid. Somebody, I got to go get him. I got to go get him. I got to go. I got, you can have 40 kids playing on a playground, playground back when kids were allowed to play on the playground. Now they just wrap them in bubble wrap and throw them outside for a little bit. Here's your five minutes of activity for the day. Come back in and do more math. Anyways, we learned a lot of math by making sure that the teams were even. Just saying. Maybe sometimes kids need to play and they'll learn better. <sighs> Go figure. <sighs> but we hear the cries of our kids and you have a playground of 40 kids and you know which kid is yours by the cry. And also you know which kids aren't yours by the cry. And God hears the cries of his children. Those times we're up late at night when we're at our wits end and we've exhausted everything and he hears our cry. And sometimes there are physical tears associated with that cry. And sometimes the hurt is so much that we don't even have tears to cry him anymore. And it's just a lament of the heart. God hears his children, not because we have so many words, but because there's a heart connection between our spirit and his spirit. And Jesus uses this word over and over again, father, father, father. And it's not, it's not just a daddy, like a little infant crawling up on a lap, but it is father. There was a time where my kids called me daddy. It was only for a few years. But when they matured, they call me father, or they call me dad. Dad, I need help. Dad, will you look at this? Dad, will you come here? Dad, I can't figure this out. Even even this last week, I'm in the middle of doing my own homework that is on a deadline. I'm like, like two hours from my deadline, and my daughter says, Dad, can you help me with my math? Which is more important? My deadline or helping my daughter? Helping my daughter was more important. And the first thing I had to do when I helped her with her math was like, I don't know how they teach you this anymore. (laughs) But this is the way I'm going to show you how to do it. (laughs) Just saying. Like, but that's not the way we do it, Dad. Like, I don't know. I don't know why they do it like that anyways. Common core math is, uh, it's it's part of the B system. It is, it is, it is... It's there just to confuse our kids. <laughs> like, and like, maybe it's not part of the B system, but let me say this. Personal aside, we're not talking about prayer right now. Pivot. We'll pivot back to prayer. Would you not think that there's intention from the enemy to create confusion between student and parent? Because then it creates a disconnect between student and parent. And then the parent is no longer to help, able to help the student, and the only person that's able to help the student is the people that have been trained in a certain way. So therefore, you've disassociated somebody who should be the first line of help to the last line of help because they've confused all the stupid stuff and tried to teach math like, just get real close. Let me say this. They did not land on the moon by getting it just real close. They got there because they got it right. (sighs) Back to prayer. (laughs) And 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 she got good grades. We got the right answers. This is the worst thing when I'm a math guy. I'm a math guy. I, I took advanced calculus. I got good grades in statistics. I understand numbers. I do mental math, all that stuff. It's bad when I'm helping my then first grader as a child and they say, do this. And I go, we cannot get to the answer to the question. And I have to go talk to the, I spent more time talking about that question at parent teacher conferences than actually talking about my child going, this is a dumb question. And the teacher agreed with me. Of course she did. I said, because if a college graduate who's taken calculus twice cannot get this answer, I took calculus twice, not because I failed it once, but because I got an A, and then I wanted to retake it. Don't ask me why I wanted to retake it. (laughs) Something's wrong with me. (sighs) Pray for me. Pray for my wife. 
She has to deal with this all the time. You guys are only 60 minutes, 100, at the most, three hours a week. She's like, this is the way it is from 5 o'clock in the morning until 11 o'clock at night. He don't stop. <sighs> Hallelujah, where are we at? We're talking about prayer. 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 <laughs> but just even, and we'll, wrap, we'll tie this in together. You'll we'll see we this. Go. We'll connect. Just even as, con- as common core math drives the wedge between parent and student, don't you think that the enemy uses the guilt of the past, our shame, our lack of understanding to drive a wedge between us and our heavenly father. Like, I don't know how to pray. I don't know how to pray. I don't know how to pray. I could never pray like this person. Let me tell you this. When some of you think like you can never pray, like some of the people that you admire, you esteem that are really good at prayer. Let me say this. You did not hear them when they started praying. (laughs) They, they, were not, they were not that eloquent. They did not have that much scripture behind them. They did not have as much teaching or understanding. They grew in their gift. Right. They grew in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. They, they didn't stay stagnant. And it's like, oh, I'm just learning how to ride a bike. And I'm comparing myself with someone who just competed in the Tour de France. Let me say, there's a different level of dedication and application of the principles of bike riding. Can you say amen? You're like, Pastor, you don't ride a bike too much. No, I do not, but I see one laying down in my driveway every single day as a reminder. (sighs) My contact moved on me. Verse 7, verse 7. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them. So when we see their example, we're to do the opposite. When they're loud and proud, we're supposed to be meek and humble. When they're broadcasting everything, we're supposed to close the door. Can you say amen? (laughs) When they're given their list of all the things that they've seen accomplished through the power of their prayer, (laughs) treasure your list. Can you say amen? Treasure your list. Keep a list. That's a good practice to have. Write down what you're praying for. Write down what you're praying about. There's going to come a time where you're in a moment of despair and you're going to need to go back to those words and you're going to be able to look back on a year ago or five years ago or ten years ago and go, oh, God answered that prayer. God was faithful to that. God did that. Oh, my goodness, I can't believe I was praying about my kid for that. We're still praying about that kid. But we're praying about him for that back then. And things are a whole lot, they're not as good as they could be, but they're a whole lot better today than they were 10 years ago or 15 years ago or 20 years ago. Like back then I was praying the spirit of suicide off of them and the spirit of addiction off of them and praying every single day that I don't get the call from the police officer that come, come identify the body of your child. Like right now we're just praying about their anger and their self-control and their impulsiveness. Like we're not even dealing with the stuff we do. That's called pride. Progress. And, and if God's been faithful to deliver from those things, he's going to be faithful until complete restoration. Amen. Therefore, do not be like them. For the Father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. Again, my own personal flaw, I hate asking people for things. I do. I do. I hate asking for help. I hate asking for support. Like even the thought of asking for funds for a fundraiser sends my blood pressure up. It does. Like I know people like they don't care. They'll be like they'll ask for anything at any time. Like they'll go to Chili's and say, what are your free appetizers? Well, we don't have any. Well, I'd like to try a free sample of this. That's not me. <laughs> I'm not good at asking for help. I'm really, I'm really good at just rolling up my sleeves and doing it. And let me say this. It's a tremendous strength because if ain't nobody else there to get the job done, I'm going to get the job done. I don't care. At the other time, it also can suppress other people's gifts and their development because there's no room for them on the team too. Can you say amen? But here's the thing about our Father. He already knows what we need before we even ask. I know my 20-year-old needs 20 bucks for gas. 
He don't even have to ask. I know that he knows it. And if he don't know it, he does know it. <laughs> and he'll find out. And there's some times where I'm like, hey, just take this. Well, I don't need it. You might not need it today, but you will need it. Can you say amen? And sometimes us parents who have large ranges between our kids, sometimes we feel bad about taking care of our younger ones so much better that we've forgotten about our older ones that we kind of all of a sudden like, man, we just spent 60 bucks on lunch with the other kids. I should do something for the older kid. That's just me. <laughs> but here's the thing. You're like, I want to be his kid. <laughs> like just, <laughs> uh, here's, here's, the cool, here's the cool thing. Short little story this morning. We had a fantastic time out at the lake yesterday. Got a lot of sun. I got a nice little sun glow going on here. Praise Jesus. It didn't get, it didn't get red, 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 but I got enough. And I'm going up there and we're rolling up there. I brought the stuff that I brought to help with everybody and uh, some of the stuff still in the van. And young man back there, he's like, hey, you got some of that stuff you brought out to the lake yesterday with you? Yeah, it's out in the van. Can I go get one? Yes, and he went and got his Mountain Dew out of my van, or my Mountain Dew. But here's the thing, he, it's okay for him to ask. Can you say amen? Because here's the thing, me and young man back there, we built up a relationship over 15 years. Come on now. And he knows, he knows like, Pastor Craig says no to almost nothing. He always says yes. If he can do it, he's saying yes. Now, if he asked my wife, my wife would go, I'm a yes dad. She's a no mom. That's why we're married together. <laughs> Marriages don't work if they're both yes, yes, or no, no. We need yes and no people in our, in our lives. Can you say amen? <laughs> she goes to her. She's going to go, young man, I don't know if you need to be drinking Mountain Dew before 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> don't, you, don't, you, don't you think you should have something else? And I'm, <laughs> and I'm like, yes. Yes, go Go get it. <laughs> but, but here's the thing. We, have a, we serve a yes dad. Come on. Yes. Can you say amen? amen? And there are times where he does say no. And when he says no, it's for a reason. And sometimes the no is not right now because you can't handle it. My 12-year-old may make jokes about driving, but I'm not saying yes to her. Why? Because she's not ready for that. You're like, but I know farmers that did this and did this when they were 10 and 12 years old. Like, yeah, they were farmers. They were not, they were not Dilbecks living in suburbia, North Hutchinson. Okay? Like, I, I, I know her decision-making tree. It is not that good right now. But because, not that it won't get there, but she's not ready today. Therefore, back to verse 8, therefore, do not be like them. Don't be like the hypocrites. Don't be too phrased. Don't do something outwardly that's not happening inwardly. For your Father knows the things that you have need of before you ask. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father, we address God with honor and respect. Can you say amen? Yeah. Our Father. Father, where is he at? He's in heaven. He's in heaven. That means he's seated far above. Amen. High above principalities and powers, rulers of darkness of this age. He's above spiritual hopes of wickedness. Can you say amen? amen. He's, abo he's above this earth's economy and this earth's health care. Can you say amen? Yes. Our Father in heaven. That means he's sitting outside of time and space. That he is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving. He knows the end from the beginning, the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. Our Father in heaven. God is not moved by what is happening on this earth today. God is moved when his people who are called by his name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways. And then I will hear from heaven and then I will heal their land. Amen. That's what God gets God's off his throne. He's not following this latest report or this newscaster or this like, oh, I can't. God knows what's in the hearts of the people. Can you say amen? People are not bent towards good if you haven't noticed it. When given the chance, a lot of people do evil things. Yes. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. God, we worship you because your name is great. We give reverence to his name. 
Hallowed be your name. God, I praise you because you've done great things and you've done great things for me. Your name is great. I'm going to make my name small so his name can be big. Hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. Well, I just want the Republican agenda to be fully instituted here in the United States. Let's pray that that doesn't happen. Well, so you want that liberal agenda then? No, let's pray that that doesn't happen either. Because they're not for the people, by the people. Can you say amen? As soon as, soon as the person that they hung their flag on goes away, they find a new one and they scatter like rats or they become like fleas and they attach themselves to the new dog because they're all parasitic pariahs. Can you say amen? <laughs> I, don't, I don't care. I don't, I don't care. It's like down goes Trump's ship. Who are we getting on to next? Whatever. They're... They're hypocrites. Don't be like Come them. On, Can you, what about the Bernie bro wave? <laughs> Whatever. Oh, I don't want to get, I don't want to go there too. <laughs> because, because it's saying, when you pray, pray your kingdom come. Oh, Lord. Not this agenda, not that agenda, right. but his kingdom, yes. his kingdom, his king. Let me say this. When it comes to the millennial reign of Jesus, there are going to be zero elections. None. Like there's not, there's not, there may be people that want to run on an opposing ticket. Guess what? They're not invited. When Jesus is in his millennial reign, he's not, he's not going to go consult with the cabinet. He's going to go, Father, Holy Spirit. We're one. What are we going to do? Let's do this. Now, do I believe that God's going to institute those that administrate in certain regions? I believe he will. But here's the thing. God's, God's form of government is not a democracy. It's not a constitutional republic. It's not communist. Communism is not socialism. It's not a dictatorship. But God's form of government is a theocracy. And everything fl flows down from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we have a benevolent God who will rule and reign over this earth who is all good. Every single decision that he makes is going to be right. He is not going to be swayed by this poll or that poll or pivot from his agenda because his kingdom will come. Can you say amen? And more importantly than the kingdom that is coming soon, we as his children, as his followers have the ability to walk out his kingdom as kingdom agents here and now because wherever the feet, wherever the soles of my feet tread, it's holy ground. I am a movable temple, a movable tabernacle that houses the presence of God because it is his desire that he inscribe his words upon my heart. And where I go, there he goes. And where he goes, I'm going. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? amen. That I don't ha just have a cloud by day and a fire by night to follow, but I have the leadership of the Holy Spirit inside of me. And I find myself in most trouble when I ignore or I diminish or I go against the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thy kingdom come. God, may your kingdom be real in our world and in our hearts. Your will be done. There's wills, there's agendas. Can you say amen? Yes. Your will be done. God, your will be done. What's God's will? God's will is his word. God's will. Is it God's will to heal people? Yes. Is it God's will to heal? Yes, yes. yes. Make sure we're all yes. Yes, yes. That's an easy one. Is it God's will to heal? Yes. If not, we're going to have to go back and start reading more of the word. But here's the thing. It's God's will to heal people. Why? Because Jesus is the expressed image of God. And when we see Jesus, we see the Father. Right. And Jesus only did what he saw the fa Father showed him to do. Right. Can you say amen? Amen. If he, he went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil. Amen. 
Healing is for God's people. Healing is the children's of bread. Can you say amen? amen. Did Jesus correct dumb religious people? 100%. He used strong language. He called them brood of vipers. He told them that their father was the devil. Can you say amen? amen. That means who was their mom married to? The devil. <laughs> strong language. Your kingdom come, your will be done. God, your word be real in my life. Yes. Your per I want God's perfect will. Yes, I want his perfect will in my life. I want his perfect will in the lives of my kids. Yes. I want it, I want it, I want it. More than my will for my kids, I want God's will for my kids. Can you say amen? I want them marrying the right person. Amen? amen? Because I've seen enough people who married the wrong person that I don't want my kids doing that stuff. Can you yep. say amen? Yeah. But here's the thing. Once you said I do, you're married to the right person. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it goes. You're like, don't come up to me after church today and go, Pastor, I think I married the wrong person. You didn't. You didn't. You're married to the right person. Can you say amen? Amen. Your will be done. He goes on to say, on earth, or as we say it, in earth. On earth as it is in heaven. On earth as it is in heaven. And man, we pray for our nation. Can you say amen? amen. Pray for our president. Can you say amen? Yes. Man, pray for him. Pray for him. But I don't like him. Pray for him anyways. Can you say amen? amen. That's a good thing. Yes. Like I prayed, I prayed for the last, however many presidents I lived with since George Bush Sr., you know what? I didn't like them all. In fact, I probably liked none. But did I pray for them? Yes. Like, why do you pray? And sometimes I'm praying that the plans that they have do not come to fruition. Yes, <laughs> right? Can you say amen? Like, do you, is it okay to pray for that? Yeah. Yes, it is, as long as it's according to the word of God and the will of God. Right. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And, and more importantly than this earth, it's more importantly for it to happen in this earth. And this earth as it is in heaven. Jesus goes on as he's telling his disciples this. He says, whatever you bind on earth. Let me find, I looked it up this morning. It's not in my notes. We haven't, got, we haven't used my notes. Matthew chapter 18. You can find this here. Matthew 18, Jesus says this. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed. And if you look at that, like, oh, that's really cool. But if you look at what Jesus is really saying in that scripture, he says that whatever you bound on earth has to be that which is already bound in heaven. And that which you loose in this earth has to be that which is already loosed in heaven. So there is a connection between heaven and earth that there's some things that we can pray, that we try to pray for that are impermissible because they're not loosed in heaven or they're already bound in heaven. Can you say amen? Yep. We have authority in Jesus' name. Amen. And the authority is that we get to call heaven to earth. Can you say amen? We don't get to go from earth to heaven until Jesus calls us up. Can you say amen? There's a part of it there where those things that are already loosed in heaven is healing loosed in heaven. Yes. Are people prospering in heaven? Yes. Is there zero conflict in heaven? Yes. That is what we're to be calling here to earth. Amen. And we can bind those things that are here on this earth that are already bound in heaven. Sin is bound. Death is bound. Hate is bound. Racism is bound in yes. heaven. Prejudice is bound in heaven. Can you say amen? National, pr national pride is bound in heaven. Because it's what? Call about calling heaven to earth. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And he goes on to this. He says, and give us this day our daily bread. Direct reference to the manna that God provided the children of Israel as they're on their 40 day, 40 year walk from Egypt. Give us this day. If you study about the manna, manna was good for one day. Except the day before the Sabbath, they could grab enough for the Sabbath and the next day. So there's something about entering into God's rest. When you enter into God's rest, you may be able to carry over a double portion. So the more we can enter into God's rest, the more we're able to carry because God preserves that which he allows us to carry over. 
But the whole connotation here of give us this day our daily bread references direct back the manna spoiled and expired by the next day. Give us this day. Jesus tells us that he is the bread from heaven. Is Jesus, and if you read over in John chapter 6, many of Jesus' disciples were turning away because Jesus had said tough language. He said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. And Jesus, on that, uh, the Bible tells us in John chapter 6, on that day it says many left, many departed, and went back to their home. And Jesus turned around in John chapter 6 and looked over at Peter and the other disciples, and he says, aren't you guys going too? See, because there's always going to be people that are following Jesus for a free lunch. Jesus had upwards of 30,000 people following him for a free lunch. As soon as Jesus got real with them, it thinned out real fast. Like, why are, why are, other, places, why are other places have perception of bigger? Maybe they're doing a better job of handing out free lunches. And maybe other places are doing a better job at speaking the truth of God's word. Just saying. It was on that day, as, P as Jesus looked at Peter and the other disciples, that he said, are you guys going anywhere too? Where are you guys going? Peter looked around and said, we don't have anywhere else to go. Because you have the words of eternal life. I've sold it all. I've lost everything. Jesus, you're sustaining us. You're the bread from heaven. We can't go anywhere else. And I feel after serving Jesus for 30 plus years that I've given up far too much to go back. Far too much to go back. Opportunity, relationships, financial gain, personal promotion. I've given up far too much to go back. So God, give us this day our daily bread. God, you provide for us. He's the one that gives us prosperity. Can you say amen? amen. Having enough to do with what we have. You, there's one guy, Elijah. Elijah prospered as God led him to a stream that was drying up to be covered by a plant and to be fed by ravens. And God sustained him in that position. How much more do you think God will sustain us? Give us this day our daily bread. Even as we saw the shortages on our grocery shelves here a little over 12 months ago, let me say this, Hutchinson does not have enough food inside of Hutchinson to feed Hutchinson for more than about a day and a half. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts. We're gonna talk about the forgiveness thing, yes, because it's in the prayer. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. God, forgive us for the things that we've done against other people because we're going to forgive those that have done things against us. Forgive us of our debts. God, forgive me of my sins. I owed a debt I could not pay. He paid a debt he did not owe. And Jesus washed that sin away. Forgive us of our debts. For the Christian, there's no room for unforgiveness in our hearts. I don't care what type of dis Pastor Jim shared this story when he was probably my age ministering, a little maybe a little bit older, but a lady coming up asking for prayer, and you're like, hey, you need to forgive that person. And she responded like, I got a special dispensation. I don't have to. We do not have special dispensations to hold grudges in our hearts. Can you say amen? Now, if people have wronged you, there may not be room for that person in your life anymore, and that's okay. Because sometimes there's a safety factor, can you say amen? There's a freedom from harm factor. Sometimes there's a distance that needs created because someone's a jerk and they just want to control. And sometimes you just need to swipe right and hit delete and go, God, I forgive them. You deal with them. I'm not. And that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. Like that's, you mean I don't have to go to their doorstep and grovel before them? No, you don't have to. Like they need to know that I forgive them. 
Not if they're still causing harm and they have an unrepentant heart. Let God deal with that person because he wants to deal with you. And you can forgive and you can forgive by faith. And if there's times where there's a reminder, you have to remind yourself, remind that spirit that's bothering you and go, you know what, I don't care. I still feel this way, but I forgive and I forgive by faith. And what they did was wrong, and God is just, and the Bible says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. So I'm going to forgive, and I'm going to release them into the hand of my father. Because guess what? When dad deals with kids, he has a whole lot more tools to deal with somebody's kids than our justification for how we feel. Like, but it's hard. Yes, it is hard. And how hard was it for Jesus as he was hanging on the cross, as the Roman soldiers were mocking him, going through... A, fo- a mock trial being his beard being ripped and out, a crown of thorns pounded into his head, his back whipped, his face battered and bruised beyond recognition. And even as Jesus is being hung on the cross, he's saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He's our example. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Verse 13, and do not lead us into temptation. God's not leading you into temptation. For some of y'all, for me, we do a good enough job finding temptation on our own. We don't need any help with that. Do not lead us into temptation. But do what? But deliver us from the evil one. There is a devil. He's called Satan. Satan. He was the serpent that was kicked out of the Garden of Eden. He was an angel that rose up and against God because pride and iniquity was found in his heart. He established an insurrection from heaven. He was kicked out of heaven. A third of the angels fell from heaven. And from that moment, Satan's desire has been to destroy God's creation. As image bearers of God, his prime target is us as humans. Can you say amen? It's been happening for thousands of years. And even as Pastor Lori reminded us this morning that Satan has but a little bit of time. Everybody say a little bit of time. A little bit of time left according to the book of Revelation. And things are going to ramp up and things are going to intensify. But Jesus is coming again soon. So do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, which means he's going to bring us out, ek, out of that hour of temptation, according to Revelation chapter 3, as he's speaking to the church of Philadelphia. But deliver us from the evil one. Why? For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. His kingdom will know no end. Yours is the kingdom. God, we're building your kingdom, not my kingdom, not victorious life kingdom, not Pope of Hutchinson kingdom. We are building his kingdom here in this earth because he has the power. He has the authority. He has the dunamis. He has the power to change. He's the one who brings life to death. He's the one that places faith in the midst of doubt. He's the one that brings calm in the midst of confusion. He has the power and he can execute it because he has authority and to his glory because he is great and we are not. He's to be lifted up. He's the one that is to be exalted. And the Bible, and he closes his prayer with amen, which means so be it, let it be. It is established, it is signed, it is sealed, it is delivered, it's going to come to pass. And one thing I know about the prayers of Jesus, and you should study the prayers of Jesus, Jesus' prayers come to pass, because he prays them according to the word of God, with faith in God as he's inspired and led by the Holy Spirit. And we have the word of God. We have the Holy Spirit. We have that inside of us. And though we look in a mirror dimly, there'll be a time where we see him face to face. And when we see him, we'll be like him. And we have the mind of Christ. And the spirit helps our infirmities with groanings that cannot cannot be uttered according to Romans chapter 8. So I want this to be an invitation to prayer. If you join us on Tuesday night, we'd love to have you here. If you can't join us on Tuesday night, look, you got three toddlers running around the house. 
Some of you moms, give yourself a break. Can you say amen? amen. You're juggling three kids. Like, and I, I watch my wife juggle. I watch my wife juggle five kids sometimes. She did an awesome job, and she does an awesome job. Like, is it okay for me to go, sweetheart, how's your prayer life going? She's like, I did. I just prayed for my kids. What? I prayed to God that I wouldn't kill them. And God, an <laughs> and God answered that prayer today. Like, praise Jesus. Praise Jesus for today. And hallelujah, you won't be doing prison ministry on the inside. <laughs> I'll, stand, I'll stand by her. I'll defend her. <laughs> Sometimes I was, some, did you, know, you don't know my kids. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on this earth as is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, for thine is the power, the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. I'll close with this prayer. The Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. Pastor Jim just recently preached on this here a few weeks ago. It's my prayer for you, and I pray it be the prayer for your brothers and sisters. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks to you, making mention you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that you know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this age but the age that is to come also so father i pray a blessing upon your people lord god i pray that heaven is real to them lord god that they can call heaven to earth lord god fill them to overflowing in jesus name lord god lord god i thank you that you supply all of their needs according to your riches and glory. For those that need jobs, Lord God, bless them with jobs. For those that need their bodies touched with healing, we say healing come and pain go.